worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of every praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever bring, We live for you, oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, There is none beside you, Open up my eyes. Jesus, the only one you could ever see. Worthy of every breath we could ever see. We live for you. You are 
We've been talking in this series about doing the right thing and then just entrusting the results to God. But what if you do the right thing and you're punished for it? Hello, I'm Brian Foreman. I'm the pastor of Cornerstone and welcome to Cornerstone Online, which is our weekly experience where we inspire and equip you to follow Jesus wholeheartedly because that's the right thing to do and also because as a loving Heavenly Father, Our Heavenly Father wants the best for us, and following Jesus makes life better and makes you better at life. If you're new to Cornerstone, we would love to be able to welcome you personally and stay in touch with you to uh, keep you up to date with what's going on with the church and resource you as you follow Jesus. So if you're new here, start here. You can text the word new to our church number, 603-225-2550, and we would love to be able to know who you are and welcome you. So... Throughout this series, which is called Insider Outsider, it's a study of the book of First Peter, the letter from the Apostle Peter to the churches, we have seen this principle over and over again. This is from Genesis 127, but it's, it's kind of an overarching principle through a lot of the scriptures. It says, God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And what this is teaching us is that we, as human beings, are supposed to be God's representative. We 
image God. We show the world what God is like. He shows us what he is like through his creation. And in this particular book, there have been these three themes that have come up, that we are outsider insiders. He's writing to people who, for the most part, are outside the power structures of this world, who sometimes are suffering opposition and even persecution from the power structures that are in this world. And he writes to remind them that because they are included in the family of God, in Christ Jesus, they are citizens of God's kingdom, that they are, in fact, the ultimate insiders instead of just powerless outsiders. And three themes keep showing up, that they are the elect, which is not just God playing, it's not God playing favorites, is his selecting us, setting us apart for his purposes, for service. Then that we are sojourners, kind of an old word that talks about how this world is not our home, that we are aliens and foreigners. So it's no surprise that we are outside of the power structures of this world. And then lastly, that we are scattered, that we have been dispersed among the world for God's purposes. And this theme that we're outsider insiders, elect sojourners scattered, shows up and is the basis for what is going on in the book of 1 Peter. And in particular, in 1 Peter 2.12, he said to be careful to live properly. Remember, he's writing to believers. He's writing to followers of Jesus who are, for the most part, outside of the power structures of this world and telling them this is how, as a follower of Jesus, you handle it when you have authorities, people in power over you who are not necessarily good and for you. He says to be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. In other words, to do right, live properly, and then entrust the outcome to God. Because for those that find themselves in this position where they feel powerless, when they have very little worldly power, and they are being oppressed and feel like they are facing opposition. The temptation is to take that situation into your own hands and because you are being treated unjustly to, in return, use whatever means necessary to get even and to level the playing field. And he is encouraging, Peter is encouraging the followers of Jesus to just do what is right and then entrust the results to God. We looked at this last week. This is a specific example of that thought process where he says, don't repay evil for evil. The world's way is if somebody does you wrong, then you hit them back five times harder. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. World's way is if somebody says something nasty about you, you can shoot right back with something nasty about them. And he's saying that's not our way, though. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. When people do evil to you, you do good to them. And then he uh, gives the reason that this returning good for evil returning insults with blessings, that is what God has called you to do. He set you aside. He has selected you for this very purpose. And he will grant you his blessing. So you can do right and you can entrust the results to God. He will make sure that things are set right in the end. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, this idea of justice, that we can entrust the results to God, that we don't have to take them into our own hands because God is watching over things and doing the right thing will ultimately be rewarded. And that's our bottom line for today. What do you do when you do right and you're punished for it? What happens if you are doing your best to do what is right in a particular situation, but it doesn't result in your receiving good as a result? And what he's saying is that you can do right, you can do that right thing, and with the confidence that you will ultimately be rewarded. So what we want to do and this will be the challenge, this will be the practical application of today, is to be conscious of your conscience. Because we have a sense 
of when we know what we're doing wrong and we want to be aware of that, pay attention to that, identify the right thing to do and do that knowing that God is watching over the whole thing and ultimately good will be rewarded. So let's look at it together. This is 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 13 to 22. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Now, who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good, if this is what God wants, than to suffer for doing wrong. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. So he went and preached to the spirits in prison, those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. Only eight people were saved from the drowning in that terrible flood. And that water is a picture of baptism, which now saves you, not by removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. It is effective because, the resurrection, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now Christ has gone to heaven. He is seated in the place of honor next to God, and all the angels and authorities and powers accept his authority. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we look at your word, I pray that you would give us insight, understanding, and that you would apply it directly to our lives so that we can know what it means for us and how to respond I thank you, Lord God, that you are a good, righteous, just God, and that you do not let sins go unpunished, but ultimately make sure that justice is served. And I thank you also that you are a merciful God, that you don't give us what our sins have earned us, and instead made a way through Jesus Christ that we might be forgiven, have a clear, clean conscience, and serve you wholeheartedly in your power. Lord, I pray that you would use this time for your glory and for our benefit. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's look at it together. Again, the idea of justice, that God will make all things right in the end. But we start with just a simple proverbial understanding that good things generally tend to result in other good things. He starts off by saying in 1 Peter 3.13, now who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? Remember, he's been dealing with people who are being oppressed and he's encouraging them. Even when you're in a situation where you're being treated unfairly, even in a situation where people in power over you are using that power against you rather than to help you, you can still do the right thing. And if you think about it, usually when you do the right thing, it results in good. If you obey the law, then you're not going to get punished for disobeying the law, generally speaking. If you do a good job at work, then you're generally going to get rewarded for that. If you are kind and understanding and gentle in your relationships with one another. Usually that makes for better relationships. So he's just speaking generally that, you know, if you just do the right thing in these various situations, then you're generally going to get a good result. So when we talk about doing the right thing will ultimately be rewarded, sometimes you don't have to wait for the ultimately. It sometimes will work out that doing good is rewarded. Or in other words, doing right 
has a way of avoiding unpleasant consequences. If you're not speeding, you're generally not going to get a ticket for speeding. If you're doing a good job at work, you're generally going to get raises and promotions, not get fired for it. So he just starts out with this basic understanding that generally doing the right thing is gets rewarded and helps you to avoid unpleasant consequences. The problem comes when we start deciding, well, I think that we, if I do it this way, if I cut this corner, if I uh, shave this ethical uh, principle down a little bit, then that's going to end in a better result. And that's generally not the case. And that's what he's talking about there. But then he goes on to say, But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So if you're going to do the right thing, generally it's going to get rewarded. But even if it's not rewarded here and now, ultimately God is going to reward you. He's going to bless you. He's going to do good to you is what that literally says. So you do the right thing. Sometimes you suffer for it. It's one of those no good deed goes unpunished situations. But he says there's there's another principle, there's another power at work that God is going to bless you. And so he says, don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Remember, writing to people who are under the power of people who are sometimes evil, Sometimes don't have the same convictions or beliefs that they do, not submitted to the Lord in the same way. Remember, speaking to wives in the previous passage, he had said, you do what is right regardless of the threats of your husband. Uh, And he's echoing that theme. Don't worry or be afraid of their threats. And so he's reminding them that even in a situation where there are people in power over you who are not going to necessarily do what is right, there is an ultimate power in the universe, in the Lord, that will make things right. So doing right, the right thing will ultimately be rewarded. And then what he's going to do next is show some of the benefits of doing the right thing. And then an example, two examples from the scriptures, from Jesus' life and from the story of Noah, of how doing the right thing will ultimately be rewarded. But before he gives those examples, he tells us that doing right makes you a compelling witness. And conversely, that if you are claiming the name of Jesus, but acting poorly, that does not make you a very compelling witness. He starts out with this, and I'm using the New American Standard because this more literal translation uses a word I want to highlight, but sanctify, and that's the word, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. He says, in this situation where you are going to be suffering for doing what is right, the starting point is to make sure that you set apart, sanctify, set aside aside Jesus Christ as Lord in your hearts. What's he saying there? He's saying, as a follower of Jesus, you are submitted ultimately to Christ. You're going to follow his lead. That's what it means to be a Jesus follower, not just that our sins are forgiven, but that we have sanctified, we have set apart Christ as Lord, that he's the boss, that he gets to call the shots. And that's the starting point. I'm going to do the right thing because I belong to Jesus. And then if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. If you're doing the right thing, even in the face of opposition or persecution, if you return blessings for insults, if you are uh, constantly following the lead of the the authorities over you, as long as it does not uh, cross the line into something that is wrong or unethical, then that's going to prompt questions. 
And then he says, because you've set aside Christ as Lord, because you've sanctified Christ as Lord in your heart, you're going to do the right thing. You're going to get asked questions about it. And that will give you an opportunity to tell people why you're doing what you're doing, why you're living the way that you're living. And then he says, but do this in a gentle and respectful way. You're going to be talking to people who don't believe the way that you do, who are in opposition to you. And he says, rather than returning with uh, an attitude of disrespect, you're going to do this in a gentle and respectful way, keeping your conscience clear, to do things with a clear conscience, to have a good conscience, to be ready to explain your hope in Christ and uh, go from there. Uh, Then it says, if people speak against you, if they're going to badmouth you, they will be ashamed. They're going to be, they're going to be shown for someone who is false because if people speak against you, they'll be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Your life will defend you. Your reputation will speak for you. So if people say bad things about you, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to return uh, insult for insult because your character, the way that you live your life, will defend you before others. Then he goes on to say, remember, it's better to suffer for doing good, if that's what God wants, than to suffer for doing wrong. He's saying suffering is, in some cases, unavoidable. It's going to happen. But if you're going to suffer, don't suffer for doing the wrong thing. Don't just get what you deserve. If it if it ends up that you suffer, suffer because you're doing the right thing and you're suffering unjustly. Make sure you're doing the right thing. And then he gives the example of Jesus. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He's saying, look, what you're experiencing as a follower of Jesus is the same kind of thing that Jesus experienced. Christ suffered, and he didn't deserve it. He never sinned, but it ended up for good. He suffered for our sins. He died for sinners to bring you. In other words, he's pointing out, you're the beneficiary of this suffering, this unjust suffering. God worked it out, rewarded Christ, worked it out for your good. You have been brought safely home to God. And that's why every message we do, I want to give an opportunity to ask you to respond to this. Are you following Jesus? We know that Christ died on the cross, but have you applied what Christ did on the cross to your life? Have you said yes to Jesus? Yes to his forgiveness. What you did on the cross, Jesus, I want that to count for me. I want to trade my sorry record because I'm a sinner. I'm one of those sinners that you died for for your record of one who never sinned. I want to be brought safely home to God. And that is exactly what Jesus offers in the gospel. So, is there a time, has there ever been a time where you have committed your life to Jesus? I'm not talking about going to church. I'm not talking about jumping through some religious hoop or getting doing some religious activity. I'm saying, has there ever been a time where you've unconditionally surrendered your life to Jesus? Said yes to Jesus, yes to his forgiveness, but also yes to his lordship to uh, turn your life over to him. If not, now's the time to do it. And I would encourage you to let us know by texting the word yes to 603-225-2550. Here's why. Because 
We want to celebrate with you. This is the best decision that you could possibly make. And we also want to resource you for your new life in Christ, to give you the resources and tools that you need in order to move forward with understanding and grow in your relationship with Jesus. So say yes to Jesus and let us know so that we can celebrate and resource you. It goes on to say that he suffered physical death but was raised to life in the spirit. So again, pointing out, he suffered a real suffering, a tortuous death on the cross. But in the end, God ultimately rewarded him, made things right. He was raised to life in the spirit. So he's given Christ as an example of someone who did the right thing even in the face of suffering and opposition, and ultimately God made things right. And then he uses that as a jumping point to talk about another example of Noah and his generation. Now, I want to show you this next verse, a couple of verses, in the message translation because I think it brings it out best. Because there are like no less than five different interpretations of what this next passage this uh, means that is talking about Noah. I think this is the best one, the clearest one, so I'll just skip to the chase and give you what I think is the best understanding and translation. This is from the message. It says, he went, Jesus went, <clears throat> and proclaimed God's salvation to earlier generations who ended up in the prison of judgment because they wouldn't listen. He's giving an example, saying uh, the story of Jesus was proclaimed in uh, a type with the story of Noah. And that just as Noah was building the ark and telling people, warning people of impending judgment, that's the same situation that we are finding ourselves in now. And he, Jesus, went and proclaimed God's salvation to earlier generations who ended up in the prison of judgment because they wouldn't listen. Because what God has done in sending his son, Jesus, to provide for salvation, it is a parallel to what he has done throughout history. And this is just giving an example. In the days of Noah, uh, Noah is building this ark, and he's doing that in preparation for, as a way of escaping the coming judgment. And so what the Apostle Peter here is doing is, in a sense, saying, in the same way that Noah was living among a hostile majority, as are you, he was the righteous among the wicked, as are you, he was providing a bold witness that he was following the Lord and that's what Peter is encouraging them to do. He's warning them of imminent judgment, which is what you can expect as well, and is a picture of ultimate salvation as well. That's what was going on. So he's saying, in a sense, Christ himself was there proclaiming salvation through what happened with Noah and the people who didn't listen. The people who ignored it ended up under judgment because they wouldn't listen. And so he uses this as a picture that doing the right thing will ultimately be rewarded and that following Jesus sets your conscious conscience right. Following Jesus sets your conscience right. He uses the story of Noah and the flood waters as a jumping off point to talk about our salvation in Christ, and particularly through the picture of baptism. He says, the waters of baptism do that for you. In other words, in the same way that Noah and his family went into the ark and then were able to go through the waters and were saved as a result, in the same way, the waters of baptism do that for you. And he makes clear that it's not uh, some kind of something about the water or the actual washing, that it's a spiritual picture, not by washing away dirt from your skin, but by presenting you through Jesus' resurrection before God with a clear 
conscience. So when you come to Jesus, when you say yes to his forgiveness, you're saying what Jesus did on the cross counts for me. Therefore, all the things that I should feel guilty about the things that I know that I have done wrong. I know that justice has been served. Punishment has been dealt out, but it's been dealt out on Jesus on the cross. And as a result, forgiveness is extended to me. So when you say yes to Jesus, the thing that you do, the very next step is to make that public, to go public with your faith through baptism. So if you have said yes to Jesus, but you, whether that's today or yesterday or sometime recently, sometime a long time ago, but you've never been baptized, that is your next step. And so he's saying here that the picture of Noah going through the waters of the flood and ended up on the other end being saved, rescued as a result, is the same picture of baptism now. That when we say yes to Jesus, we get baptized, we are put in the water, symbolically showing that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We are raised up to uh, symbolically present ourselves as living a new life, just as Christ was raised from the dead. And as a result, we have a clear conscience before God because we know that our sins are covered by what Jesus did on the cross. And so he says, now Christ has gone into heaven. He is seated in the place of honor next to God. You see, Jesus was mistreated. Jesus faced opposition from evil men. Jesus, nevertheless, did the right thing. And Peter is using Jesus' example to encourage his listeners, his audience, to follow God in the same way, to do right, even in the face of opposition, even in the face of unjust authorities, knowing that you are entrusting yourself to God and ultimately he will do what is right. And he says, Jesus is a picture of that. Christ has now gone into heaven. He is now seated in the place of honor next to God and all the angels and authorities and powers accept his authority. So here, think of this. The followers of Jesus that Peter is writing to are suffering under unjust authorities. And he's encouraging them to do the right thing and entrust the results to God. And then he uses Jesus as the example, who also faced opposition from unjust authorities, who was even killed, murdered by those unjust authorities. But he entrusted himself to God. And what happened to him? He was raised from the dead, and now he is seated in the place of honor, right at the right hand of God. And all those authorities that persecuted him, all of those authorities that thought that they had power over him, he now sits above every spiritual and worldly authority because he is the ultimate authority that doing the right thing will ultimately be rewarded and you only have to look at Jesus for that example. And this is a this is a beautiful twist because here Jesus was and his unjust suffering suffering that he did not deserve, suffering that was unjust, suffering at the hands of unjust authorities, just like Peter is saying, what you are experiencing right now, look at what God did with that. It's only because Jesus suffered these unjust, this unjust opposition this, these murderous threats that were ultimately carried out, it's through that that you now experience salvation, that you have been forgiven of your sins, that you have been adopted into his family, made citizens in God's kingdom. So you can trust that whatever you're going through right now, that God is watching over that he will ultimately reward the good and he's going to use 
even unjust suffering for his purposes. Maybe it's going to be your testimony, your witness, the the way that your life is lived that will speak to others about the reality of Christ. Maybe in some form or fashion, your suffering is going to end up in others' salvation. It's going to point them to Christ and they will put their faith in Jesus. But we have this ultimate promise, this ultimate understanding that even if you suffer for doing the right thing, that God will make things right in the end. So here's the practical step that I'm going to give you today, and that is to be conscious of your conscience. He starts out by saying, you're going to do the right thing. Sometimes that's going to be rewarded just because that's the way the world often works. But even if not, we have the responsibility as followers of Jesus to follow Jesus' example and do the right thing regardless. We have a clear conscience because we know that our sins are forgiven. We should go forward with a clear conscience, not violating that conscience in an attempt to to make things right by our own power or to get back to return insult for insult, opposition for opposition, whatever the case may be. So as you're going through life, you might be thinking of something even right now where you've been tempted or even crossed the line and you violated your conscience. You know that you've done the wrong thing. Just be aware of that. Be conscious of that. Don't ignore it. And then just reject that idea that you have to do that in order to make things right and instead entrust the outcome to your heavenly Father. Instead, identify what would be the right thing to do. What is the blessing, the good that I can do in this situation, even if it's undeserved, even if that's not what was given to me, even if that's not what I can expect in return, because that's the example of Jesus. Identify what's the blessing, what's the good thing that we could do in that situation, and then do that. And we have God's promise that he will reward that, that he will do good to us, not because we deserve it, but because that's who he is and he has included us in Christ. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I pray that you would give us the gift of a tender, sensitive conscience, that we would hear from you when we violate that, that If there are some who have a guilty conscience that has not been cleared through the blood, the death of Jesus on the cross, that today would be the day that they would say yes to you, that they would have a clear conscience knowing that their sins are forgiven, that their debt has been paid, that their punishment has been meted out to Jesus on the cross. So they don't have to feel guilty anymore. They can accept the gift of a clear conscience from you because of Jesus. And I pray that we, who are your followers, would live lives that, are, that lead to a clear conscience. That we would be sensitive to your spirit when you convict us, and that we would do the right thing entrusting the result to you. And I thank you, Lord, because you have promised that in the end, you will make all things right, that we can entrust justice to you, that you have helped us by forgiving us, by helping us to uh, avoid the consequences of our past sins, and that you have set us apart for doing right, doing good. And I pray, Lord, that that would be the case, that we would be known for our good reputations, for doing the right thing, for returning blessing for evil, and that ultimately you would receive the credit and glory and honor that is due your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.